You're listening to Food Psych, a podcast about nutrition, eating disorders, and body image. I'm your host, Christy Harrison, and I'm a registered dietitian nutritionist and certified intuitive eating counselor specializing in health at every size. Join me as I talk with interesting people from all walks of life about their relationships to food. Hey guys, welcome to episode 73. This is a really exciting episode for me because I'm talking to Evelyn Triboli, who is the co-author of the book Intuitive Eating. And for those of you who know me and have been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that I'm a big fan of intuitive eating. I have an intuitive eating online course that I do. I coach people on intuitive eating. I'm a certified intuitive eating counselor, and I actually trained with Evelyn to become certified. So it's really exciting and a huge pleasure and honor to talk with her about her relationship with food and her work over the years and you know the whole food psych thing and she's doing it and it's really been a long time in the coming because I thought of the idea of having her on the podcast years ago and just never reached out and made it happen so once I did she said yes right away and we made it happen and I'm super super excited to share this with you guys because I think not only is it um, just fascinating to hear her story and you know the sort of backstory of co-writing the book on intuitive eating but also she answers some sort of frequently asked questions about intuitive eating, including what's up with the idea of intuitive eating and weight loss, and, you know, has some really um, helpful guidance that I think clarifies some concepts in intuitive eating. So if you guys are interested in becoming intuitive eaters, if you're working, you know, towards your own practice of intuitive eating, definitely check out this conversation. You don't want to miss it. Um, So I can't wait to share that with you in just a moment. Before we do, I just have a couple of quick announcements and really a couple of great resources to help you improve your relationship with food. So the first one is my free quiz to assess your relationship with food and whether it's healthy or needs some work. And I'll send you your results via email along with more than a dozen individualized tips and resources to help you make peace with food wherever you may fall on the spectrum right now. So you can take the quiz and get your results today at my website. It's christyharrison.com slash quiz. That's christyharrison.com slash quiz. The second resource I want to share is my intuitive eating online course. It's a 13-week program that I created to help you work through all the principles of intuitive eating in depth and really demystify and troubleshoot some of the common areas where I see people get stuck. So I'll show you how to recognize the diet mentality, even in its subtle forms, and how to start substituting healthier thoughts instead. I'll share my secrets for making food and exercise choices from a place of self-care rather than self-control. That's kind of my mantra for the course, self-care, not self-control. So I'll show you how to do that. And I'll teach you how to navigate emotional eating and how to stop alternating between restricting and overeating and lots more. So it's a really great course and I'm super happy to have had a big cohort of people go through it already and they're saying great things about it. Um, So several participants have shared that the course helped them make peace with their off-limits foods and get comfortable with foods they thought they would never be able to keep in the house. And as one participant said after completing the course, this course has been life-changing for me. It has completely opened my eyes and allowed me to let go of some of the last parts of my eating disorder that I didn't even realize were still a part of me. I can't say thank you enough times for this course and for all the work you do in this field. So thank you for that. And if any of you listening would like to join others on this intuitive eating journey, you can head to christyharrison.com slash course to learn more and sign up. That's christyharrison.com slash course. And then finally, if you like the podcast and want to help us reach more people who need to hear the body positive message, you can leave us a great review on iTunes. So you can either open up iTunes on your computer or on your phone, type in Food Psych to the search bar, click on the result that comes up under podcasts, and then click on the ratings and reviews tab. And there you can leave us a rating and review sharing what you love about the podcast. I'm always so grateful for the nice reviews. They really make my day. And they also help bring us up in the ratings so that more people can find us. So if you want to help spread the word about Food Psych, that's a great way to do it. And I'm so grateful to everyone who's left a review so far. And now, without any further ado, let's go talk to Evelyn Triboli. I spoke with her via Skype from her home in Los Angeles, California. So tell me about your relationship with food growing up. 
Well, you know, I had a, a classic uh, relationship growing up as far as family dynamics. I was uh, <laughs> raised with the Clean Plate Club, where basically uh, I was one of four kids. There were six of us all together with my mom and dad. And this rule was so strict that even uh, giving food to the dog was considered wasteful. So I grew up cleaning my plate. And I would also say... You know, there was probably a little bit of competitive eating, too, because once the food was gone, it was gone. So I, I tended to eat a little bit fast. But um, the one thing I also remember really well that I'm very fortunate with is we really grew up with a balance of foods. It's like my mom uh, was a stay-at-home mom, and she had this routine of first going to this amazing produce store. It was called Plavoy's. I don't even know if it exists anymore, but it had the most amazing fruits and, and vegetables. And she would stock up on that, and then she'd go to what we'd call the junk food store. <laughs> and donuts and cakes and cookies and Twinkies and all that stuff. And we had um, all of these kinds of foods uh, growing up at the same time. So they were never a big deal. We enjoyed them, but it was never, uh, nothing was ever off limits. And, you know, it's funny when I'm getting to some of this own history with my, with my patients or when I'm, when I'm giving talks, you know, when they look at the relationship with food, as you know, it's not just the food itself, but what about the relationships with the important people in your life? And I grew up with a, with a dieting mom. And one of the really interesting things that I reflect back on is on the one hand, yep, she was constantly dieting. She was on Weight Watchers. I knew where her goal weight was. And yet it's nothing that she foisted onto us as kids. And the thing that was very different growing up back then is in spite of the fact she had this high body dissatisfaction, it never stopped her from participating in life. She was always in a bathing suit or always you know, going water skiing or doing trips with, with the water. So there was never any body shame going on. And I'm really grateful growing up that that was never an issue. Then as I grew up and I was in high school, food became especially important to me uh, in a different focal point because I was a competitive athlete. And I'm going to date myself. Uh, back in the day I was competing, they didn't have a girls track team in my high school. So I ran on the boys team in boys clothes and boys shoes because I didn't even make girls apparel back then. And so um, I got really interested in what food can I eat to make me run faster and, and beat more boys. <laughs> I got fascinated by that. So that's kind of a short, short um, history of my of my relationship with food. So overall, I think it was a pretty, pretty healthy one. Oh, you know what? And relatedly, relationship to my body. See, I like to talk. Oh, um, no, that's great. <laughs> that's what this podcast is all about. So. One of the things looking back, um, and again, this is so different than, than from today, because I was uh, competing very in a very serious level and working out with the boys, at the end of our, um, well, like usually at the end of the week, we got into this little routine where we'd be sitting in a circle and we'd all point our feet inward. It was kind of like, it looked like a little big daisy or something like that. And what we were doing, we were looking at the veins in our legs to see who had the most anastomosis. I don't know why I remember this, I do, but who had the most vascularization because it mean we were it meant we were really getting fit so we were looking at our bodies in terms of performance do you know what I mean not not based on on size and shape and all that uh, kind of stuff so I, I think that was something I was very fortunate to grow up with as well that's so interesting did anyone around you any of your peers think about size and shape or sort of convey that to you as something that you should be thinking about no, in fact, I'll tell you what's really weird. I look back now and it feels really weird. So I went into, when I was in college, I competed at cross country and, and track. And back then, oh my God, our, our uniforms were so revealing. It was like running in underwear. It was like Dan Scan's French cut. And the reason I'm sharing this detail is I, I can remember my thoughts as especially in cross country, because you're competing with all these distance women, and we were in a, a you know level one. A, we, were, we were competing with the, with the big universities, so these women were really in shape. And I remember looking at their legs and thinking, "Oh, people who are in shape have cellulite. This is normal." Do you know what I mean? So we weren't thinking about body size the way that we see it so much now. And in my private practice, I work with a lot of athletes, and it's just really sad to see that the focus on that as as opposed to the as opposed to the, the performance. So yeah, that was kind of different. <laughs> Very much. That's such a good detail to share. I think that like actually helps a lot of people probably because yeah. it's so different now. It's like you're expected to not have a single flaw, quote unquote, on your body if you're an athlete or otherwise. And yet it's it's so true that really high performance athletes have cellulite and have fat in certain areas of their body and that's completely normal. 
It's completely normal. In fact, I also went through this, it's not a phase, but I went through a um, significant thing in my career working with a lot of patients with eating disorders and athletes. And they would start to make assumptions about my body. I think they were projecting, but they were assuming what my body would look like. And I talked to a couple of therapist colleagues of mine and asked them, I said, you know, there's something I'd like to share with my patients, but I don't know if it's too much information, if this would be helpful or not. And they said, well, what do you want to share? And I said, well, basically, if they were to see me in a bikini on the beach, they would see a fit woman, but whose body has cellulite and stretch marks from having two babies. And this is what what fit looks like. I've been fit all my life since um, high school. And so as I shared that detail with some of these therapists, they said, you know what, it'd be wonderful for some of our patients to to hear this if you're comfortable doing so. So I, I do that as well because we need it. We need more modeling as to what normal bodies come in all different shapes and sizes. You can be fit in all different shapes and sizes, and we need to really respect our body and give, give it the dignity. Our, it's our house for the rest of our lives, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great – I'm so glad to hear that, and maybe I'll take a page from that book and start sharing that kind of stuff too because it really is true that, you know, you can be – fit and also have fat on your body. And I do too. (laughs) I actually shared something similar with a client recently who was like obsessing about fat on her stomach. And I was like, look, everything I've achieved in my life, everything I'm happy about, everything that means anything to me has happened with fat on my stomach. Like I, the times when I was pursuing not having fat on my stomach were the times that I was the most unhappy, the most unsatisfied, the furthest away from my goals professionally and personally and just in life. So, you know, it's like it comes with the territory. You got to have the fat to be able to live your life, really. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's so so fascinating. So it sounds like there wasn't really a strong diet culture necessarily among your peers um, at the time. No. It was just my family, my mom. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so let, me, let me go with the complete story of my mom. This is a sad story and true mm-hmm. story. And she was diagnosed with uh, ovarian cancer at the age of 64. And it was obviously a very upsetting diagnosis. She, she died later at the age of 67. And I was with her. I don't know why it was just me and my mom. And it was like the day after her diagnosis. And we're getting ready to go to the hospital for some more procedures. And we're sitting in my living room having like this deep mother-daughter conversation, you know, tears flowing, pass me the tissue, that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden she stands up, she makes a circle, she inspects her body and she looks at me and she says, Ev, she calls me Ev, uh, you know, all of these years of dieting and all I want to do now is grow old to see my grandkids. And I tell you that was so sad to hear her say that. And I see this in, in the lives of my patients that they think that, oh, once I get a certain age, I will stop. You know, unless you work on this and making peace with food, having a healthy relationship with food, mind, and body, it's this constant background anxiety that's going to haunt you that doesn't have to haunt you, you know? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it takes away so much from your life. There's no magic point when it's going to end unless you do the work. Yeah, unfortunately true. Or fortunately, because there's a lot of growth that happens from doing the work. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people, especially these days, grow up with such a disordered relationship with food being modeled all around them that it's almost like, you know, you can't really learn a healthy relationship with food unless you go through some hard times and are forced to look at it. Because I think if you don't go through any hard times and you're sort of just skating by, it often ends up being that you have a pretty disordered relationship with food, but it never gets so bad that it takes over your life. So you're just kind of like a little unsatisfied and a little feeling bad about your body all the time, but there's no incentive to work on it. Right, right. That's the beauty of, of pain. It's it's the transformation that can happen, you know? Mm-hmm. I think that's the shadow side of any kind of painful experience in life that you know, there's there's growth and there's wisdom if you're willing to learn, but it, it can be a painful process and it's a slow process, the, the learning. It's very humbling. It is. Yeah, it can really set you back. Did your mom ever sort of come to terms with that at the end of her life? Is that part of what kind of drew, drew you into this line of work or... No, you know, that never drew me into this line of work. I mean, that, that's the thing I think is so amazing. I, I really feel like I was unscathed by her dieting. And I think because because she had... In a strange way, how she felt about her body never stopped her from what she wanted to do. You know, she was always athletic, wanted us kids. I mean, she, you know, when I was running on the boys' track team, I, you know, I rankled some feathers there. They didn't want to give me a letter, even though I 
you know, did everything I was supposed to do. And my mom was there supporting me 100%. So we had a lot of confidence in instilled. So all her dissatisfaction on her body was aimed just at her. And that that was it. You know, it didn't trickle down to to us. So I was I was lucky in that regard. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's really sort of a blessing to have it be contained like that. Yeah, very much. So how was that experience at college running competitively? Did things sort of get shaken up there or? It did. In fact, I'll tell you a funny story. I, I used to be kind of a health food nut back in high school, although according to today's standards, it would be nothing, you know, but it, like, ooh, I wouldn't eat any sugar. That was my big thing. And I was, you know, vegetarian and I, I, I stuck to my guns. And so then I, and, and back then, frankly, I, I was used to winning races. And whenever I had races with, with girls in other high schools, I used to usually beat them, not always, but usually. So when I got into uh, college, oh, my God, that was humbling. I was getting my patootie kicked. <laughs> <laughs> and so even then, even on my team, I, I remember one of my teammates, her breakfast, she would eat like six donuts. You know, I'm thinking, oh, my God, she's eating six donuts and she's kicking my ass. You know? <laughs> And this is before I was a nutrition major. I started off as a, as a PE major, physical education, wanting to be a coach. So having that experience to see, well, wait a minute, all of this diligence, is this really making a difference for me, you know? And then as I changed my major, as I think as a sophomore in college, and started to learn about the chemistry of nutrition and that there's not really that much difference as far as energy is concerned, that, that blew me away, you know? That was really, that was humbling. But I find when I share this story with some of my patients, it helps to kind of cultivate some compassion that we all start off with these noble noble ideas that we think is the right way and the righteous way to feed a body, you know, and then we learn, oh, it's not. <laughs> you know? Right. And maybe the body actually performs better on six donuts than, you know, sugar free, vegetarian, whatever. Yeah. And I was, you know, and the other thing, being a college student, you know, oh, my God, I had a crazy schedule between I, I used to train in the morning. And then I'd ride my bike, ride my bike to the university. It was like close to ten miles to go to school, and then train with the team, and then ride my bike back, back home. And so there were days that you know I didn't skip meals intentionally, but it would happen, and my performance, my workouts would just really suffer. And I never forgot that. And so when I'm seeing patients who are chronic dieters, and they tell me how they hate exercising, and I'll tell them, I don't know how the hell you did it. You, to exercise and not get enough to eat is I could barely do that as an athlete on a day or two. And the last thing I'd want to do is deprive my body because I would feel such a tremendous difference in, if I was to withhold food. So it, it's funny looking back how all these experiences that you think are ordinary or meaningless actually have a, a lot of meaning, you know, mm -hmm. as you look back through the filter of wisdom in, in the years, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. These little pivotal moments that like kind of provide so much insight. Yeah, yeah. How did you get the idea, sort of going back to high school for a second, like how did you get the idea to do a no sugar or vegetarian diet in the first place? Well, you know what? Well, I was just, I was, I was literally trying to get my hands on anything to read about nutrition and exercise. And back then, you know, keep, keep in mind, there was no internet. <laughs> <laughs> right. So basically there was like Runner's World and I think a couple other magazines. And so I would just read whatever was out there. And, you know, there were a couple of, you know, health foodie, uh, non-scientific based books that I read and that seemed to make sense to a non-scientific mind. So that's how I kind of got hooked up onto that. I had one coach, I'll never forget this, who told me he wanted me to eat so much wheat germ that if I was to be cut open, I would bleed wheat germ, you know? Oh, God. <laughs> wow. That's just a food, and it's pretty innocuous, but I didn't really do anything uh, crazy, and I, I look back, and I wonder, wow, if I was compete, if I was in high school now in current day with the way things have gotten so really just nuts with, with eating in terms of, you know, raw, gluten-free, vegan, and all that kind of stuff, and by the way, I mean, for some people, it, it can work for them. It's, it's when it gets really rigid and interferes with living that, that that concerns me, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's these things people sort of just attach to for moral reasons often, and it's, yeah. it's like a, a way to self-flagellate when they don't meet these stringent standards. Well, yeah. And then, well, then there's all kinds of stuff. And I, I do work with some vegetarians who do it not for moral superiority, but rather because of an ethical philosophy they have towards animals. And, you know, ultimately, we just need to make peace with what our value system is and that to remember that whatever it is that we choose to do, that we're not har harming ourselves in the long run or, or other people in, in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think like you can absolutely be vegetarian or even vegan for ethical reasons, but 
it's sort of interesting, especially with like disordered eating. I think that's where it gets very muddy because it's like is also is some of the motivation, you know, to feed the eating disorder, to lose weight or to have more restrictions, then that's not necessarily the best approach right now but absolutely in fact one of the things i'm always fond of of saying to my my patients and the people i train is what is the intention behind the behavior that will often give us the answer in terms of is this the path for me to go is this the way i need to nourish my body today yeah that's a great question to ask yourself i like that so you know it sounds like then in college you sort of opened up your horizons a little bit and ate more different foods did your nutrition studies support that well, that's, that's what opened up my horizons. I basically got educated. <laughs> <laughs> so you saw, yeah, that the body sort of treats everything equally. It's not preferring uh, one type of macronutrient over another or whatever. Well, yeah, and I think it actually helped me loosen up because, you know, in undergrad and in grad school, we had to do a fair amount of, you know, nutrient analyses on our eating. And again, that's back when there really wasn't computers. So we were looking, oh, my God, this is so old school. We had to look it up in books. and But I still remember thinking, wow, I'm doing really good because I eat so much, you know? <laughs> <laughs> So that's, I mean, it, you were really coming to it from a place of fueling your performance and yeah. eating for nourishment, which is awesome. Like you you kind of were eating intuitively, it sounds like, in the sports context anyway. For the most part, but as you probably know, with, with athletes, actually, you don't even have to be an athlete. If you're working out intensely, that can also temporarily, you know, blunt your hunger. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you have to also be finding ways to work with that as well. So did you recognize that in yourself? I did. I did. And then this is a little side note. The other thing that got me really interested in, in nutrition, I used to have problems with my stomach when I was running. In fact, I will never forget this. I had, this is so funny. I had a, <laughs> I had a typing class in, uh, high school and people don't know what typewriters are. I was a typewriter, like a keyboard, but there's no computer attached to it. <laughs> And one of our big projects is we had to write a letter. I thought, if I'm going to write a letter, I'm going to write a meaningful letter. So I wrote to Runner's World, to the doctor who was on staff, Dear Runner's World, when I run, my stomach goes bloop, 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 and I get all these symptoms. And the reason I'm telling you this is that was the first thing I ever got published in a national magazine. That got published. Wow. So fast forward, I'm in college, and I'm working out with my coach. And he looks at me. He goes, you know, I just read a letter with someone who has your exact symptoms. <laughs> I said, that was for me. So anyway, I was always looking at what I could eat to kind of have a peaceful relationship with my running. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And that became more of a timing issue than anything else. So, you know, I've just always been curious. I think that's probably the thing that keeps fueling anything that I still do is this, this insatiable curiosity that I have. That's a great quality. That's oh, thank you. Silly. Yeah. <laughs> Love that. So what, what happened then after college? Did you go kind of straight into a dietetic internship and start training to be a dietitian? Kind of. Um, and what I, it's so funny. I've always been off the beaten track. What I did is I went straight into grad school. And back then, when you did the, the grad school track, you had something that was like an internship, and, but you had to create it and get it approved and all that stuff. So that's, that's what I ended up doing. And this is when actually I was, I, I was training. I was so excited. They let women run the marathon distance for the first time ever in the Olympics. So I was training for the Olympic trials marathon and I eventually qualified. So it was a really busy time in my life in terms of putting in all these hours and, and working and then also training my, my body. <laughs> and I can still remember this. This is talk about honor your hunger. So here I am, this little fledgling intern and I would be hungry and, and I'd be working with sometimes I mean, they were really, really, really nice dietitians, but some of them were kind of on the workaholic side where they wouldn't take breaks. And I there, I'm sorry, I need to feed my body. I can't go on. And I, it became a kind of a joke that everyone's got to eat. You know, it's like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm training and I need, I need to feed my, my body that I'm pushing so hard. And actually they're all very, very understanding. But when you're low on the totem pole to be able to speak up like that, it was just kind of, you know, different. Yeah. It does take a lot of uh, self-confidence to be able to do that. Yeah, or I don't even know if it was confidence. It was to me, it was just more. It's a, it was a need. Just like you can take a Ferrari race car, and those are great cars and perform well. But if there's no gas, man, it's not going to go. And the same with an athlete. And I, I just kind of knew that, you know. Facts. <laughs> uh, I got to feed my body. <laughs> I agree again. So yeah, that's like so reassuring and sort of refreshing to hear as an athlete because I feel like I see so many people who are athletes and have very disordered relationships with food. You know, where they think like they're sort of ashamed of how much they need to eat or, you know, get into that relationship of not really feeling hunger and then sort of 
pushing off eating for too long. And, you know, it sounds like you really were, were sort of in touch with your body in that way. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I find that still true today. I'm still very, I'm, I, I'm athletic. I love to do stuff. I do a lot of hiking and a lot of other kinds of things. And I was at this meditation retreat and let's see, we had had a pretty nice snack and we're eating lunch and I was remarking to this guy, it's like, oh my God, I'm so hungry. I can't wait to eat. He goes, you just ate a lot of food. And I said, that's absolutely right. I go, my body's been moving and it needs food. And I remember thinking at that time, had that comment been made to one of my patients, they might have felt devastated by it. But I just remember thinking, I got to educate this guy, you know? (laughs) That's amazing. Yeah, this is this that didn't happen that long ago. So yeah, you're right. It's um, it's sad how sometimes people feel like they need to apologize or justify their eating when it's like no hunger. Exactly. <laughs> you can, only you know what that feels like. Only you can be. Only you are the expert of your body. No one else could possibly know ever. Right. Do you feel like your parents helped instill that in you in terms of like feeding you when you were hungry and always having food available? You know, that's a good question. My instinct is I want to say no. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And I'm thinking about it more from the flip side as far as, you know, having the the clean plate mentality. But you're mm-hmm. right. Um, when I look back on it, my parents were very generous just as far as their, their social nature. They're always feeding anybody who stopped by, you know. So mm-hmm. in, in that regard, yeah, because our pantry was always full. We always had had snacks to eat at always. So yeah, I, I, I guess you're right. I didn't even think about that till just now. Mm-hmm. That's so interesting. I'm curious about that too, because I had my own, you know, eating disorder history. And I think one of the things that was so salient for me in that was this um, sort of shame about my hunger. Like, of course, when you when you're in an eating disorder, it it makes shame about hunger even greater or sometimes can bring it on where it wasn't even there before. But I think I had this sort of well of shame about hunger that was like waiting, you know, that was sort of lying in wait, um, ready to sort of burst forth with my eating disorder because I, I, you know, was sort of allowed to eat fairly intuitively and encouraged to have a fairly decent relationship with food in childhood. But one thing that was a sort of a common refrain, especially with my dad is like, you know, you got to eat now because we're not going to stop later. We're not going to have a snack. And then if I did want a snack or I wasn't hungry for the meal, but I was hungry again a few hours later, it was like this national scandal, you know, (laughs) it was like, I told you and like, you know, and I was made to feel very ashamed about it, which of course, a lot of the time I would sort of rebel and be like, well, screw you. Like, I'm just going to eat and, you know, not sort of overtly not care about it but I think that was in there and it you know really came out when I was in my eating disorder too wow you know it's funny as you're saying that I was reflecting on my dad he would do two things especially when we went out in restaurants he would sometimes bribe us to finish our plate or it's like a reward you know and then he would brag about it like oh this this little kid here just ate all her spaghetti you know and there was no scene there was actually pride in it and so mm. that's interesting, <laughs> that's interesting. Mm. yeah yeah back forward then again to like your dietetic internship and then when you started working, did you know what you wanted to specialize in when you were becoming a dietitian? You know, it's funny. I knew eventually I wanted to be in private practice, but I, I was highly influenced by my, my peer group. I had been a, a, what do you call it, a diet technician for about four years working my way through undergrad and grad school. So I knew having a clinical background was really important. And I was really, really lucky where I trained at. I mean, dietitians were really progressive. You got to write orders and manage all the cases and so on. So long story short, I got my first job. I worked at Cedar sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And I did that for a year. And then boom, after that, I I just went, I, I went into private practice and did a lot of freelance writing and um, all, media and all kinds of stuff and had a, a lot, a lot, a lot of fun. It's really fun. Yeah, the media stuff is great, too. Yeah. Did you always know you wanted to do that? You know what? I ha- it's funny. I used to have a sense that I knew I wanted to write. And you know what? It's interesting. Oh, gosh, I really am myself. Dietitians weren't really, there wasn't that much in terms of media, even there weren't that many doctors doing media. But I became... Um, Early in my career, a spokesperson for the California Dietetic Association and got a lot of media mm-hmm. training. And then from there, went on to become a national spokesperson with the, I want to say, <laughs> I can never remember the acronym now, <laughs> Dietetic Association, but now it's the A-N-D, yeah, Academy. Thank you. Yeah, I wouldn't even saying it for, you know, the other way for so many years, it doesn't roll off my I tongue. Know, I know, I <laughs> know. <laughs> that was really great experiences, too. Um, had a, um, a regular spot in Good Morning America for about just a little over a year, and that was a tremendous amount of fun. I remember thinking, God, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. This is, this is fun. <laughs> That's cool. What did you do on Good Morning America? Well, I was there on-camera nutritionist. So I would do nutrition segments. 
So I'll never forget one time I, I woke up and the front page of the New York Times had something to do with how with, with pasta is bad for you. Oh, <laughs> God. Page the New York Times. They said, you got to come in and do a story. So I was on a plane that day and the next day talking about why our body still needs carbs. You know, our brains need carbs and so on and so on. So some things, unfortunately, still don't change. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know. I feel like there's always stories about that now, like myth busting stories that dietitians like us have to do. <laughs> ah, and it's, you know, it's funny, especially when you're working with, with patients and individuals, it, it's, it's so important that we do it in a way that uh, is not shaming or making them sound like, oh, what an idiot. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. And, and what I see happening with some of my, my peers, it's like, wow, I, I guess because of social media now, a lot of consumers can feel like they're an expert in something. And it can feel sometimes more frustrating than to help kind of debunk these myths in a way that's both scientific and yet respectful of, of the person in terms of, you know, why they're doing what they're doing. And sometimes, like you were alluding to earlier, they attach more meaning to patterns of eating in terms of their own morality and self-worth. And then it gets a little bit uh, tricky, you know? Yeah, absolutely. That's a helpful reminder, too, because I write a lot of those types of articles and I try to be compassionate, but I also think like the more I get steeped in this, you know, intuitive eating, health at every size, body positive type of nutrition, the more like the sort of less patience I have for the other way. And the more I'm just like, oh God, would people just please stop believing this, you know, which I think is, you know, an energy that maybe could be used to fuel my pitching of those articles or, you know, the work that I do in general with like the podcast and stuff. But I, I don't think it's particularly useful in the article itself because I don't want to make any, anyone feel bad, you know. Yeah. Or, you know, what happens and I, you know, it's funny. I, one, of, one of my strengths as an individual is I, I have a lot of energy and I have a lot of passion for things that I, I have passion for my work and I have, oh, compassion for some of my, my patients and the stuff that they've been through. And what I have to caution my own self with is I, with this passion, it's easy to get on a soapbox, you know, but if you're too intense, especially on a one-on-one level, I think there's a place for it, like when you're giving talks or something that you need that. But on a one-on-one level, if we get too know-it-all and righteous about what we know, then we end up building walls and we need to be building bridges and letting people see, you know, why it is their way of thinking might be actually doing more harm than, than good. So it's something I like to try and keep in check with because who's going to want to talk to somebody who already has their mind made up? I'm talking about, you know, the expert who has their mind up. That would be a problem. So I'm, I'm always trying to remember to stay open no matter how justified I think I am in my opinion, you yeah. know? That's great. That's a great reminder, too, because it's like, you know, the context is everything. I guess one of my favorite words, context. Yeah, it makes so much sense. I mean, and also I think people's journeys with intuitive eating and health in general are so personal and so sort of winding that like no one person is going to be able to say, hey, you've got to do this. And then it just clicks right away. You know, I think it has to be people come to it on their own and sort of start to understand slowly. And if you know, I think healthcare providers, it's sort of our responsibility to be with them through that and help shepherd them through that rather than just like say, here's how it is, you know. Right. Because it's not empowering otherwise. And, and there's more uh, power for them in, in the discovery where they know it to be true for themselves, you know. And, and I see this a lot where maybe a, a patient has read, you know, intuitive eating and intellectually they get it. Intellectually, they want to be there, but they're just not there yet. It doesn't resonate. And that's really, really common. It, there's nothing wrong with the person. It's just that they need to have their own experience with it to know it's true for them, that it's true for their body. And, you know, When there's been so much dieting in the history, you know, every time somebody is hungry and they try to trick it and fake it out, they're really eroding that trust. But conversely, every time you honor hunger with every single bite of food you put into your mouth, you're rebuilding trust. And I find that a really powerful, powerful thing. You know, when you think about the mind and neuroplasticity and how the more we have repetition and our neurons wire and fire together, well, the same thing is true with experiences that may seem like, oh, I'm just eating my mail here, (laughs) you know, but there's a sacredness to it. If we can look at it like that, it's really kind of beautiful. Absolutely. Yeah, that's such a great point that it's we, we can make it sacred. We can make it feel nourishing and lovely to honor our hunger because 
many people who've spent time in disordered eating have made it sort of a chore or like a thing that you're never supposed to do, like a forbidden thing to honor your hunger. So it's all in the context you give it. Totally. In terms of that, I've, I'm so curious, like how you got the idea to do the book Intuitive Eating or how you sort of came to doing this type of work first. And maybe the book was sort of an offshoot of that. So I'll tell you, the, the, it's, it's so funny. Uh, there's, there's many things that, you know, a confluence of things that happened. And one of them, yes, was the type of work. You know, I was working just kind of a general practice, working with some eating disorders and seeing a fair amount of patients who wanted to lose weight, not my favorite thing to do. And Elise Rush, my co- co-author of Intuitive Eating, was also doing the same thing. And it was getting frustrating. You know, you're putting together these beautiful meal plants and... <laughs> Now, uh, your patients are doing well. And then, you know, two years later, they come back in and they're blaming themselves because, you know, they, they, they screwed up or something. It's like, this this isn't right. This isn't working. And I think by the time we wrote Intuitive Eating, I think I'd already written three or four books. And so here's the confluence of factors that I just, I just, I love this story. <laughs> so I was, uh, this was before I was a regular on Good Morning America. I was doing a guest spot and most people don't know this, but with national media, it's somewhat scripted, meaning they know who the guest is, they've outlined the questions, and you have a sense of what the answers are going to be. So that's what I mean by scripted. So there was a technical difficulty, and their next guest that was supposed to come in wasn't able to come in. And they asked me, could you stay and do another segment? And I said, sure. And they said, okay, you've got two minutes during commercial break to come up with something. <laughs> <laughs> And actually, it was, you know, because you're all hyped up anyways, high energy after doing the, the first one. It, 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 it didn't, f- it was like effortless effort is what it felt mm-hmm. like at the time. Mm-hmm. And so what we agreed on was to do something on what I called primal hunger that describes what happens to people when you cross that line of biology, when you are so hungry, you don't care. It's like, man, I'm going to kill you if I don't get that bagel. That kind of hunger, you know, it's, it's very mm-hmm. impolite and... So anyways, I ended up doing an interview on that. And you know, it's funny because I'd done a fair amount of media, even as I was giving the interview, it felt like I was really connecting. And so it got a lot of attention and I got a call from a a publisher and said, you know, it sounds like you've got a book on in you on that topic. I said, as a matter of fact, I do. (laughs) And it was just kind of like the grassroots of intuitive eating. It was kind of a non-dieting kind of book, kind of like a uh, you know what? The, t- the title is terrible. It was going to be Psycho Nutrition. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so, funny. <laughs> but, but the psychological aspects of this. And then meanwhile, unbeknownst to me, Elise was working on something. So what ended up happening is um, I was working with somebody else that, that it, it, it fell. It didn't go well. And I was, I ran into her in the hallway and was, was asking her, hey, do you want to write a book together? Because this kind of book at the time with intuitive eating, you know, right now, it's so exciting that it's kind of a kind of well-known concept. And it's got a lot of research now behind it. But back then, you know, that was a really novel idea to eat basically whatever you want with, with attunement. It was kind of scary. And Elise has a lot of strong, one of her strongest suits is her counseling and her psychological um, insight. So anyways, we decided to write the book together and put together this proposal. And we got in a very fortunate situation in which we had several publishers interested in the book. So they, they were competing. It was a, you know, election for the manuscript. And here's where we really got lucky. You know, we ended up with St. Martin's and they, you know, bought our concept, love the concept. And after all is said and done, contract signed, they said, you know, we love the book, but we'd really prefer it if you can make it more how to, like maybe you can turn it into steps. And I will tell you that was one of the most luckiest things to happen. This is one of the confluent factors is that by us being willing to turn it into steps, or in this case, 10 principles, what ended up happening is it made it measurable. You know, so the first book came out in 95 and I can truly say it was research inspired. We went to the research in terms of what is going on. Why would it be important to allow yourself to have permission to eat whatever you want when you're hungry? We used our clinical experience as well and came up with these 10 uh, principles. But then Tracy Tilka a researcher out of Ohio State University in 2006 really published what I consider the first seminal study on intuitive eating. There, there had been like a another small one um, published from somebody else, but this one was done on 1,400 college women, and basically she asked two questions. It's like, can you? Is there any benefit to being an intuitive eater, and can we measure it? Can we measure what what the components are of, of intuitive eaters? And the answer was yes, yes. And it's actually four parts of the study. It was all, but it was all really good stuff. <laughs> It really kind of launched it on the map. So that was in 2006. And then this is where it gets weird in a good way, too. 
I got a call from People Magazine, and they wanted to interview me. And I used to work with a fair amount of celebrities, and I told them, I said, look, I don't talk about who I see at all. I'm happy to give you background information and generalities, but I will not name names. And they go, oh, no, no. This is somebody who has who's swearing by intuitive eating, and we just want to interview you on, on the book. And I go, really? So I did the interview, and when they called me back three days later to fact check it, I go, oh, my God, this is actually going to go in People magazine. And they said, yeah, it's going to be on the cover, and it was. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. So in that year, so we had this big study coming out, and then we have this story in People magazine, and it, it went crazy cuckoo around the world. I remember telling Elise at that time, we got to get a website up just to <laughs> – <laughs> Our web launched in that year as well. So it was in that year. So the book had been out for almost nine years, but it was in that year that it started to get in recognition both on a um, media level and on a research level and, and so on. And now fast forward, um, today there have been over 60 studies uh, looking at intuitive eating and finding all different kinds of benefits, which I find just incredibly exciting because, you know, this is a, a model of eating that was put forth by, by two dietitians, you know, in, in the trenches. And it's something I feel really proud of, uh, of, our, of our work. Like we've made a mark for our profession, but more importantly, for the people that, that we work with, this, as you know, with this work, you, you change lives. You really change lives and empower people. They get their, their lives back. And, you know, when I'm, when I'm working with brand new dietitians who have not been exposed to this, because maybe they've been to universities where it's not required, some universities require this, actually, I'm happy to say, they're like, oh, no, we just count calories. And it's like, you know what? Come back to me in five years and tell me how that's working. Because in the first five years, everything seems easy. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but I've had others where they will say, oh, I had no idea. And, I, and basically in tears, tears of compassion, because they didn't realize the harm that comes from dieting. And I would even mm -hmm. argue that when this dieting is being endorsed by health professionals, I think it adds an extra whammy, an extra dose of shame or this idea that, wow, I'm not competent because I work with this dietitian and I can't even get my act together with, with him or her, you know? Yeah, completely agree. It's the process of dieting or food restriction in whatever terms you want to call that really is the problem. Yeah. I think that's so powerful to recognize because like there's so much that goes under a different name that's not called dieting, but it is the diet mentality. Like I loved that that is a principle in intuitive eating and it just resonated so much with me when I first read that. Well, actually when I first read it, I was still recovering from disordered eating, you know, years ago. So I, at first I was like, what? Reject the diet mentality. What are you talking about? I don't diet, you know? So I had, had uh. some feelings about it that I worked through, but you know, then sort of coming back to it and deepening my process with intuitive eating, it was like, yeah, there's so much that is the diet mentality that just goes under the name of quote healthy eating or quote like you yeah. know healthy lifestyle change or whatever that's you know clean eating. Calories, clean eating yep portion <laughs> control all of that stuff just watching it all mm -hmm. of that all the euphemisms involved and it, it can be rather shocking and you know, when I when I give talks to health professionals and I'll tell them, I really believe with the research we have to date, it is not ethical to recommend any kind of dieting. And when you see, you know, the that study that came out in the spring of 2016 of the biggest loser, you know, made a lot of national headlines about, oh my God, their metabolism dropped calories. It's like, yeah, those of us in the field completely would predict that. The part that didn't get enough attention, that didn't get any attention in the media that blows me away is when you actually say, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a geek. I'm in touch with my inner nerd. I just love <laughs> And so when you look at the methodology and you look at the details, it's like when you look at their baseline muscle mass and then six years later, six years later, they still had not corrected their muscle. They lost more muscle and they had less muscle at the, at the end of six years than what they started off with. But that's, that's awful. And then when you look at their blood sugar levels, their blood sugar levels actually meet the criteria for prediabetes and no one talked about that either. So this idea that you lose weight in the name of health is not backed up by science. And which is why we hear about the obesity paradox and the wonderful work of, of Carl Levy, Chip Levy, who wrote a book by that same name. But he's a cardiologist and researcher who's really done a lot to show that, you know what, folks, it's not the weight that matters. It is your, just your overall health and especially when it comes to fitness. But it's one of these 
dogmatic belief systems that it's going to, I don't know how much more research it's going to take, you know, to get through to some of these, these people. And so what I will often do is just say, you know what, ethically, I can't, can't go in that direction. The research is not there. When you think about the, the classic Ansel Keys study, which I'm sure you're familiar with, where they put those conscientious objectors during World War II on semi-starvation diets, and you saw that they created eating disorders and obsession with food, you know, that in the 50s, and with so much research showing that when kids diet, they start binge eating, it increases the risk of eating disorders, and now new research coming out showing, hey, guess what? It also creates something called fat overshooting. How in the world is this healthy, you know? And so when we see things like, I, I've been kind of amused, I probably shouldn't be amused, but I've been <laughs> amused watching the business news on weight watchers because the stock is going way down they're blaming the business models like it's it's i think consumers are finally starting to get it you know because of social media and other things that hey guess what dieting only does not work it actually makes things worse it hurts you you know mm -hmm. yeah it is finally getting out there and i feel like all of this social media can be so helpful some of it can be hurtful because i think there is a lot of social media that still proliferates the diet mentality but there's also so much social media to the contrary now the body positive movement and intuitive eating and health at every size like those are you know really sort of growing and reaching a lot of people absolutely it's exciting to see actually it really is so in terms of like you know your approach to writing the book and kind of how strident to get or how how much to you know put in of the anti-diet movement because I know that was sort of that research was there and was burgeoning at the time probably that you guys were writing the book and you know the the like fat acceptance movement I know goes back to the 70s so did you sort of think about that stuff and incorporate some of that into the book? And like, did you just have to sort of decide how political to get and how much to like harp on the idea of body acceptance and size acceptance or kind of dial it back for more mainstream appeal? I will tell you this, it's been an evolution. So when we wrote the book, the concept of non-dieting was popular among health professionals. And the problem, though, when you say non-dieting, like, well, what's that? You know, like non-carbohydrate, non-dieting. That was, I would say, that was, that was really burgeoning at the time. And, you know, the health at every size movement was just really kind of get, getting going. But I'll tell you what has changed. And, I, and I, I actually really like this, that we've evolved. You know, when you look at the first two editions of intuitive eating on the cover, it's called a slug or the sub headlines. It says, get to the natural weight that your body was meant to be. Now, the truth is, I technically don't have a problem with that language, but there's a problem with the language. It makes people weight more weight focused and they start assessing and judging if they're doing intuitive eating correctly based on what's going on with their weight, which is absolutely a problem. And mm -hmm. so what we did on the third edition is we, we were prepared to go to battle with our publisher to take that off the um, cover. And most people don't know this, but authors don't have much control over the cover. And mentioning weight, you know, is a marketing thing. But we were so happy that they said, yeah, whatever you want to do. It's like, oh, thank God. So we took out any mention of numbers. And we actually, you know, in our uh, one of our principles, you know, is respect the body. We actually added a really solid section on health at every size, that health at every size has to be there. And then now I think we mentioned, you know, we have, um, you know, our intuitive eating workbook coming out in the spring of 2017 that I'm so excited with and and we had already signed the contract and then our publisher a different publisher says you know we really want the book to stand on its own and Elise and I our intention was it would be a companion but it's like okay we'll write it so it stands on its own and so if we're going to do this we might as well update the research so not only did we include the health at every size of course we have to but we also really strengthen it with the obesity paradox research that's coming out and then in all the trainings that we do we really talk about how you have to put weight loss on, on the back burner and we can't make this weight focused and I don't know if you're familiar with ACT ACT action the acronym now <laughs> acceptance and commitment therapy I think yeah one of the things they say is you can't go in there with the goal of 
reducing your symptoms. And when every time I read that, it's like, yeah, like with intuitive eating, you can't go in with a goal of weight loss. And the truth is, for some people, a side effect will be weight loss. You know, if you you know stop binge eating and you discover that you enjoy movement and you're doing these things, yeah, you might end up losing some weight. But there's other people whose weight might stay the same. You know, it's just it's it's all variable. And so we really need to keep and reframe the conversation at health at every size. We need to have a weight neutral approach to this and in all of our outcomes. And actually, that was another reason why we were motivated to do the intuitive eating workbook, because although there's been all these studies now, they're really more associative studies. They show all these benefits, but there haven't really been much in terms of the way of intervention. And so by having this workbook, now we have a standardized form in which someone can go and implement the intuitive eating process in a in a very consistent manner. Because, you know, one of the problems, you know, that we, <laughs> this is like good news, bad news. We got so excited when people were just talking about intuitive eating. It's like, oh my God, we're talking about it. And then it, as it started to get popular, people started adding their own spin. It's like intuitive clean eating. It's like, and that started actually certifying health professionals who, who train in this, in this method. So it's not getting perverted. And that's one of the big fears right now being discussed, you know, behind the scenes uh, among health professionals is a fear that the weight loss industry will somehow try and subvert intuitive eating into a weight loss model. And that is not uh, what that's supposed to be. We've seen this already happening with some of the mindfulness based eating that just really kills me. It's like, Oh yeah, your diet didn't work because you weren't mindfully eating. It's like, no, you're, diet didn't work because you were dieting and all the mindfulness in the world is not going to change your biology as far as you're eating and that's where that can really really mess somebody up you know yeah absolutely and I'm I'm so happy to hear you share that message because I have shared that here a bunch and talked about that with other guests that you know intuitive eating with the goal of weight loss doesn't work and isn't how it's supposed to be used and that you know there are a lot of unfortunately like coaches and you know well-meaning people out there who I think want to do good and want to help people but don't understand sort of the cultural context and like all that went into developing intuitive eating and are sort of cherry picking really yeah because I think there's it's like if you read the book and you really digest the book, it's all in there. I mean, especially the third edition, it's all there. You know, there is this reject the diet mentality thing is very strong and, you know, honor or respect, respecting your body and health at every size. And like all of that is, is, you know, something that you could, um, you know, someone who was interested could then go and read more on all those topics and immerse themselves and like really get it and sort of flourish. But I think, Sometimes people are just like, oh, eat when you're hungry, stop when you're full, like then you'll lose weight. You know, it, it's, it turns into, the, as my colleague Isabel Fox and Duke likes to say, the hunger and fullness diet. You know, like I can only eat when I'm hungry and I have to stop when I'm full. Otherwise, I'm bad. Well, and let's, let's stop right there for just a moment because you're raising a really good point. And that is this is that anyone who has a diet mentality mindset can inadvertently take intuitive eating and make it into a diet. And so one of the things I stress with intuitive eating is that these are principles or guidelines. They're not rigid rules. And there is no pass or fail. There's no right or wrong. In every eating experience, there's something that can be learned if you're willing to look. You know, even in an instance when you, let's just say for the state of the, <laughs> that you did overeat, Okay, on the one hand, that might not feel good, but what does that mean that you blew it? Let's see what happens the rest of the day. Let's see what happens to your hunger. Are you still hungry at, at dinner? You know, that's not this. We're living in a culture as if we're we are one bite away from trauma, one bite away from disaster. You're one bite away from you know from from obesity, and I think in part because people are so used to micromanaging everything they do, they don't realize our body is quite capable on its own. But the other thing I also wanted to mention, I think what gets confusing for health professionals is there's been a, every study that has actually looked at body body mass index and intuitive eating has shown that intuitive eaters have a lower body mass index without internalizing the thin ideal, which is actually rather promising in terms of this. You know, people who are not familiar with the research of intuitive eating who criticize the, the, the principle of make peace with food, basically eat what you want with attunement, they'll say, oh my God, people who overeat, they'll eat too much. And so when you have research saying, well, wait a minute, people who are intuitive eaters actually, you know, are doing quite okay and they're very stabilized and help with some of that, that fear mongering. But to then in turn mm -hmm. and say that, you know, you're going to lose weight doing it, I think that's a, a big, um, 
you're promising something that you don't know is is or will not you, you don't know what's going to happen with somebody's body especially given mm-hmm. if someone's been dieting all of their life you know what do you think has happened to their metabolism you know and we have to look at yeah. what realistically they can expect and looking at quality of life issues i think are really really important in terms of um you know one of the saddest stories this happened over the holidays a few years ago i was working with uh, um, an older mom older meaning that her kids were all in college they were coming back for you know the thanksgiving break and she was so excited to see them, but she was so preoccupied about eating and losing weight that my, my biggest fear for her was that, wow, your kids are going to come home and you're going to be thinking about, is it okay if I eat this? How many calories was this? How many calories was that? Because she was so focused and worried and obsessed about uh, her body that you end up missing out on relationships. And when you're dieting, it's kind of like when you're on the phone with somebody and you can tell they're checking email or they're texting or they're doing something, I mean, they're participating in the conversation. The words are correct, but you can tell there's something missing. And that's what happens when you're dieting. You're missing, you're missing out on your own, your own life and, and the richness and the things that renew you and make you human. Yeah. Oh, and it's true that that presence or that lack of presence really can still be there if you're approaching intuitive eating as a weight loss method, just as with any other diet. It's like, oh my God, am I, am I full yet? Should I eat that other bite? Am I, you know, am I hungry enough to eat? Like you can get, you know, people can get very obsessive about it. And, you know, I think if you can really like internalize this concept of rejecting the diet mentality, I think it goes a long way into just making it all a little easier and a little more flexible. Right. And so what I would say too, you know, is anytime if you're feeling guilt around your eating, that's a sign there (laughs) that you're in the diet mentality or you have some food rule or some food belief that needs to get looked at. Because unless you killed someone to get that donut or that cookie or stole the money, there's no reason to have guilt around this, you know? I love that so much. It really puts it in perspective. Like you did not kill someone. You just ate a piece of cake. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I love that. Well, it's, I mean, your book has has touched so many people and it really was instrumental in helping me recover my own relationship with food. So, I mean, it's amazing the work you're doing and I'm so excited to see the workbook coming out soon. So tell us a little more about that. Like when is that going to be available? Where can people find it? Yeah, so it's coming out April 1st, 2017. It's being published by New Harbinger. And basically what it is, it, it's really focusing on the 10 principles of intuitive eating. And there's lots and lots of activities and exercises. So it, it's about the process and less about the theory. There's, you know, about each chapter has about maybe two pages of an update or some science just to, you know, remember why we have this principle. But then it really gets into the how-to. And this is something we've been asked uh, to do over and over again by by readers of our book, by health professionals, and so finally <laughs> we, <laughs> we put it together. And you know what's really interesting is when you write a book with another person, it, it actually is harder. You end up getting a much better uh, process, a much better concept. And you know, Elise and I feel very, very strongly about the integrity of of intuitive eating and how it gets conveyed. And so sometimes in our our own wordsmithing, we might say, "Well, I think it could be more effective this way." <laughs> <laughs> Because we want everyone to be, you know, connected. And so I'll tell you what's really a little bit different about this. And it has to do with the research behind interceptive awareness. And interceptive awareness is a long term, but it basically Mm -hmm. describes our ability to perceive physical sensations that arise from within the body. And that may sound like, who cares? Well, let's put this into perspective on how much power that gives an individual. So... Every state, such as if you're sleepy, if you have a full bladder, that has a physical sensation. Obviously, if you're hungry or you're full, that's a physical sensation. Every emotional feeling has a physical sensation. So when Mm -hmm. someone is able to get in contact with what's going on physically in their body, it's powerful, powerful information that helps inform decisions that you might be making. But when you're stuck with rules in your heads of what should be and what should not be, then that interferes with this amazing process. So 
when you look at the research on intuitive eating, intuitive eaters have a higher level of interceptive awareness. It's not a huge surprise, but it's actually, it's, I find it fascinating. And there was a study published out of Germany a couple of years ago. They did a beautiful job of summarizing the research and the benefits of intuitive eating. And then the, the scientist says, but hey, how do we know if someone's capable? I thought, wow, that's a really good question. And they said, you know, we can measure interceptive awareness objectively. And it turns out there's been this standard in research for years. And what it is, it's having somebody perceive their own heart rate. And I thought, oh, piece of cake. I can do that. I've learned to do that all my life as an athlete. But then as I read the methodology, it's like, oh. And perceive means you don't touch your heart. You don't, put your, you don't take your pulse. You literally just sit there and feel your heart beating without touching uh, anywhere of your body. And meanwhile, you're hooked up to electrodes and they, they match you know, the electrodes in terms of counting your heart rate versus what you actually perceived. And what they found is sure enough that people that perceive their heart rates are have higher interceptive awareness and, and are intuitive eaters. So using the research, we have actually created a lot of exercises to help people connect with this this aspect and more important to to value it and when you start taking a look at uh, intuitive eating at the 10 principles they're either working to improve this connection this body awareness this interceptive awareness or they're working at removing the obstacles and the obstacles to body awareness really comes from the mind and with the mind we're talking about you know the diet mentality we're talking about your thinking process in terms of the food police we're talking about how you cope with life and so on and so on and so it's so powerful and i love that concept of an interoceptive awareness too as like sort of systematizing because I definitely get asked a lot by clients like how do you know when you're hungry or how do you know when you're full and sometimes that's coming from you know because they have so much blocking it like the disordered eating mindset or the diet mentality but sometimes it's like a genuine just sort of disconnection from their body like right you know, some people don't spend a lot of time feeling into their body so you know, any somatic experience is a little bit foreign to them. It is. In fact, sometimes I call this uh, cognitive somatic restructuring. Words for that, well, wait a minute. Let's make sure that we're talking about the same thing, that you know what? Hunger is normal. Passing out from hunger is not normal, <laughs> you know? And so sometimes this is something else that we've added in, in the workbook is looking at the qualities. You know, people, most people know how to rate their hunger on a scale of one to 10. That's been used in a lot of things, you know, the like heart rating. But one of the ways I like to do it, and this comes from uh, actually from a lot of Buddhist psychology research, is looking at the qualities of pleasant, unpleasant, or normal. So I'll ask somebody, well, what does pleasant hunger feel like to you? Or what do you think it would feel like? What does unpleasant hunger feel like? And then conversely with fullness, what's pleasant fullness feel like versus unpleasant? Just that conversation alone is really enlightening. First of all, has anyone ever had an experience with it? You know, and I've had people say, I have no idea what pleasant hunger is. I always try to avoid it like the plague, which is ironic because then the more they avoid and try to trick the hunger, the hungrier they get. And they get into this, this mess of intense high urgency eating because they're, they're in that primal hunger place. So that's also a really nice way of looking at it. You know, that this should be a pleasant experience. Eating is one of life's pleasures. You know, it's something that the, the French know how to do really, really well. And I will, say to my patients, half joking, but actually serious that, you know, my gosh, look at the French, they eat real white sugar, <laughs> real white flour and real butter. And they're healthier than we are as a nation. You know, they have uh, one of the lowest rates of heart disease in, in the world. And yeah, they take their time with eating and they savor their eating. They enjoy what they do. Um, and I think we have a lot to learn from, from them actually as a culture in that regard. Yeah. We're so cut off from pleasure and that's not a value around food that's instilled in us. Yeah, and actually what's kind of nice when you're working with patients, and I sometimes we'll, you know, we'll work with, start with uh, aiming for satisfaction in your eating. That's not the first principle, but sometimes it, we'll start there. You don't have to start in order. Uh, it helps sometimes, but you don't have to. And what that be like? You know, because if you think about it, if you're under eating, ultimately that's not satisfying or pleasurable. And if you're overeating, ultimately that's not satisfying or pleasurable. So seeking satisfaction in your eating is a highly individual experience. And it's rarely something that anyone's ever been asked or taught how to do, you know? And then when you, well, what would you need in order to cultivate this experience? You know, would you be you know, texting and listening to the radio and having the TV on while you're eating? Do you think that would... <laughs> The smart ass is asking that, and yet this is what many people do, and they're very reluctant to eat without distraction. You know, and years ago when I would ask somebody to do that, 
it wasn't a big deal, but now it's like I'm asking them to give away their firstborn. So what I will often do is start with, well, what would be a first step you could do? Could you start with one meal that you would commit to eating without distraction? And then often there's a yes to that response. I don't try and, you know, force somebody into something they don't want to do. And then the question comes up, and this kills me every time. Well, what would I do then? <laughs> <laughs> And my answer is, well, you'd eat. But actually what I do with that is I actually give them a focal point, something for their mind to to focus on. And it's it's kind of very similar to when you do meditation. There's usually a focal point. It, often it's the breath. But with, with eating, I'll have them pick a, a focal point. You know, do you want to focus on the taste? Maybe you want to focus just on how the food looks. Each bite before you put it in your mouth that you look at it. Or maybe you want to focus on, on the aroma. Let's pick one quality that will be your focal point so that when you get distracted in your mind, you keep coming back to it, whether it's the taste or, or something like that. And it's, it's really a fascinating process. I love, I love, uh, I'll, I'll lead sessions, how people bring in their food and we'll, we'll go through something like this. And at the end, I'll have them pick one of those qualities to work on over the week, not, not even the whole aspect of it. So I really break it down. I love that. That's so powerful because it does give you something to kind of keep coming back to just like the meditation, but it also increases your pleasure in the meal. It does. And that's, you know, that's so profound when you look at the research on, um, it's, it's funny, people, most people are very familiar with distracted driving, that if you drive on the phone, you can get in an accident, and it's, it's a serious thing. And people also know that they have the illusion they can do it safely, even though they really know you can't. And the same thing with eating, which is why I call it distracted eating, that you have this illusion that you can eat your bag of cookies and watch the TV at the same time and take it all in. But we know that's not true from the research over and over and over again. And the mind can only focus on one thing at a time. And why would you want to rob yourself of all of the pleasure of eating? You know, you can certainly watch TV whenever you want to. Does it have to be, you know, with your meal? And by the way, one of the things I want to stress, you know, I'm talking about all these optimal qualities to have when you're doing intuitive eating. But we also have to be realistic. I mean, sometimes the best thing you can do is, is to be eating your breakfast in the car while you're on your way to work. Mm -hmm. At least you're nourishing your body. I call that self-care nourishment. You know, you don't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be pretty. I look at what do you do most of the time? What do you do most of the time for the most part? That's that's really the key issue. Yeah, that's such a great point and also super healing and helpful, I think, to anyone who's listening and struggling with this stuff because, like, it is self-care and that's a part of – I always say it's like your inner caretaker. Like, that is a part of your intuition is this part of you that wants to – take care of you and make sure you're okay and you're fed and you're satisfied. And that part might be saying, you know what, you got to bring this egg sandwich in your car to go because we're running late, but you have to eat, you know? And yeah. That's, it's like, okay, so I'm not going to savor this without any distractions today, but maybe later. Right. And it's, it's, it's not a travesty. <laughs> <laughs> right. Some patients who will kind of take it to the extreme and think that every meal needs to be a 10, you know, it's like well, sometimes a meal is going to be ordinary. Sometimes it's just getting the job done. Sometimes it's like wearing a pair of sensible shoes, you know, <laughs> they yeah. don't make a statement, but they get the job done and your feet are okay at the end of the day, you know? Right, right. exactly. So helpful, I think, to frame it that way. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Well, I could talk to you forever, but I want to be mindful of the time as well. So I want to just let people know where they can find you and your work online. Sure. So I'll start with something that can benefit everybody. We launched a free community website. We have over 10,000 members now. It's the Intuitive Eating Online Community. It's free. You just have to sign up. That's how we keep the spammers out. But it's great support. We have a dietitian who once a month leads a, a monthly chat for questions for our, our members. Um, we also have our main website, intuitiveeating.org. And then there's also my, my personal website, evelyntribley.com. That's probably the easiest way to find me in terms of my email and, and that kind of stuff. So yeah. Amazing. That sounds so great. And I will link to the intuitive eating workbook once it comes out. So by the way, it's actually on the on the Amazon website right now. You can order oh, it if you I know we're so amazing. Excited. I love pre orders. That's so great. For the the color and we're hoping the color will change, but it's this bowl of soup with little hearts floating up from it. It's like, oh that looks oh, so lovely. So yeah. So sweet. <laughs> oh my God. Yes, that's great. So I will link to that in the show notes. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah. Thanks so much, Evelyn. Great to talk with you.
All right. Have a great week. So that's our show. Thanks again so much to our guest for being here and to you guys for listening. We'll be back again in two weeks with another brand new episode. So be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Android or whatever your favorite podcast app is if you haven't done so already. Meanwhile, I'd love to stay in touch with you online. The best way is by email. So if you join my email VIP list, you'll get exclusive tips about intuitive eating and body positivity and updates about all my work as well well as new episodes of the podcast. So if you go to christyharrison.com slash email, you can sign up there. That's christyharrison.com slash email. And I would love to have you guys all on my VIP list. And then you can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We're at Food Psych on Facebook and Food Psych Pod on Twitter. I am also on Instagram, just me this time. I don't have a separate account for the podcast, but I'm on Instagram at Christy Harrison. And the first I is a one. The music you're hearing behind me now is by a band called AWOL and the track is called Food used under the Creative Commons license. Thanks again for listening and until next time, stay psyched. Stupid or scared, no work in the kitchen now. Who put you there in that perfect position now? Who want your food and you ain't really beat? Have you ever won?